please take your virtual seats. Um, so let's get started. Hello, everyone. Just let you know, I'll be recording this. Okay, we are already recording. Um, okay, so welcome. Hello. My name is Guilherme Alves. Um, I'm a journalist and researcher from Brazil. I'm part of the Youth uh, Like IGF um, Committee, and I will, be, I will be facilitating this webinar. This is the fifth webinar of the open course uh, on internet governance held by the Youth Observatory, the Youth Special Interest Group of Internet Society, as part of the Youth Like IGF 2020 agenda. Uh, Youth Like IGF is an annual event created to spread the word of internet governance uh, to young people all over Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, this year, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, our event will be held online as a remote conference uh, on the 1st and the 2nd of August. This, uh, this open course is part of our pre-meeting agenda, and it will be recorded and shared later on the Youth Observatory YouTube channel. Uh, if you want to stay up to date about Youth Like a Jeff and Youth Observatory, please follow us on social media. So I want to say a huge thanks to our special speakers, Andrea Doyle and Caio Machado. It's very nice to meet you. Uh, they're also from Brazil, and they kindly accept our invitation to uh, share with us their insights uh, on one of Youth Like a Jeff 2020 core topics, which is misinformation and, and problems, issues with social media. There are definitely a lot of things uh, happening around these topics, and we're glad to have you here to share with us your insights. So, uh, Andaya, could you please introduce yourself briefly to... Yeah, so of course. Thank you very much for inviting me. I am um, an information science PhD student. I study the concept of uh, critical information literacy and uh, uh, gender stereotype deconstruction. But I uh, also have a research partner who's called uh, Ana Brezol. And uh, with her, we wrote a paper on uh, disinformation. And uh, this is what I'm going to share with you tonight. Um, so can I, can I start? Okay, uh, first, uh, let, let us uh, hear about Caio. Caio, could you oh, also yeah. please introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Um, I, is, is everyone hearing me and seeing yeah. me? Because yes. I'm not seeing anyone. I think my internet isn't that great. Yes. Okay. Hear you. So if you're hearing me and seeing me, I think, I think we're fine. Um, so my name is Caio Machado. I'm a lawyer and social scientist recently finished a uh, master's at the University of Oxford at the Oxford Internet Institute, where I was a researcher at the Computational Propaganda Project looking at information. And uh, in a couple of months, I'll go back to Oxford for my PhD, where I'll look at um, disinformation in the scientific domain. And I hope uh, I'll be able to share a little bit about that with you guys today. So what I've seen and what I'll be looking at uh, in the near future. Okay, thank you. Um, so before I give the floor to Andrea, let me ask everyone who's with us tonight to please mute your microphones. Uh, if you want to disable your webcam, there's no problem. Um, if you have any questions or comments, you can use the chat box. I'll be monitoring it. And after each speaker, we'll have a couple of minutes to answer questions. So, okay, Andrea, you have the floor. Once there are five minutes left, I will just raise my hand, just to let you know, uh, but no pressure. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. Okay, thank you. So, uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, as the title is very specific, is information, disinformation, and critical information literacy. So, um, uh, first of all, I would like to show you a movie. So, I'm going to ch uh, change into Chrome. Do you see it? So, I'm yes. going to... This, this is uh, uh, Lumiere Brothers, uh, one of the first movies ever made. It's called The Sprinkler Sprinkle. And... Um, uh, 
if you don't know it, uh, it's just to put a pin on it because we're going to go back to it at the end. The sprinkler sprinkled from the Lumiere brothers and I'm going to talk with you uh, at the end of the um, at the, of my speech. So to start I am an information scientist and so I'm going to talk first about information. Uh, Rafael Capullo is an information philosopher that uh, writes a lot and we study him a lot here in, in Brazil in my program. I'm from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and it's um, my program I forgot to, to tell you about. It's an uh, information science post-graduation program. It's uh, uh, with also with the Brazilian Institute of Scientific and uh, Technological Information. So at my program, we study Capuhu a lot. He has a paper where he goes uh, over more than 700 definitions of information, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, he says it starts with the idea that to inform is to give form, to uh, mold, to, to give a shape. And um, what we study in information science we have a paradigms of the way we research and we think. So uh, first we were in the physical moment and we thought information was objective. For instance, the information was in the book. Inside the book, you found the information. Then uh, when we, uh, by the eighties, we had a cognitive turn and we started thinking that information was in the, the person's head. So uh, it was subjective. And then by the 90s, we have another turn and we had the social turn where we understood that information is intersubjective. It's not inside the book. It's not inside my mind. Uh, it's in the relation of us. Um, what uh, it means, uh, uh, in fact, is that uh, information is socially, oh, uh, information is always socially constructed. So that means that it is always influenced by cultural, political, economic, uh, social, personal, historic, um, a lot of context, a lot of uh, um, different things that um, have an influence in information. So uh, also we have that the production and dissemination as well as the search and use are intentional action with an impact in the world. And Farid is another information philosopher that says that there are actions that are good to the infosphere, that is the informational environment and some other actions are bad for the infosphere. I'm not going to go into this debate, but it's a notion that is studied in our field. And also uh, that information is made by people to, to people and people have their ideas, their um, way of, to see the world, their goals, their limitations, their interests. So uh, information is not neutral ever, uh, nor independent of bias. It is never impartial and always partial. So uh, this is the, the, um, the state of the art, uh, to say, of my field in this moment. And so uh, we're going to put a pin on that too. And uh, we're going to understand information as the social creation to uh, study disinformation. So disinformation, uh, the, the, the work, uh, the research I, I did with my, my research partner, Ana Vizola, 
is that we compiled the ideas about this information from three main authors and some others. Uh, Volfi, which is the, the one I studied most, and uh, Pascal Serrano and Noam Chomsky, which is, are the ones um, Anna studied most. So what I, uh, I am going to present a perspective of this information. Uh, the, sub, uh, the title of Volkov's book is A Little History of Disinformation from the Trojan Horse to the Internet. So it starts with the first point is that this information has always existed. But uh, what we see today is not the, the birth of this information, but the, ex the explosion, the exponentiality, as, in, as we have more and more access to information, as we create more and more information all the time. So this information goes uh, with it. To Volkov, uh, this information is the manipulation of public opinion to achieve political ends with tampered information. It is not necessarily false. And uh, the, um, the high leg is the high level expert group. They had a, a multidisciplinary report on this information and then defied, they defined it as all forms of face inaccurate or misleading information designed, presented and promoted to intentionally cause public harm or for profit. So what Volkov says it's for political goal and what the um, high leg um, say is for uh, harm or profit. So uh, what we did, as I said before, is that we compiled uh, several of those ideas. And uh, I don't know what's happening here. Can you can you see the disinformation concept map? No. 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 Okay. Ah. Uh, okay. So there. Uh, so this is uh, what we compiled from those authors, uh, Serrano, Chomsky, and Hoff. And we have here a concept, uh, uh, causes, purposes, contemporary contexts. But what I want to talk to you specifically is the mechanisms. Because as we're going to talk about in the end about critical information literacy, it is important to understand how something works in order to pay attention to it on the daily basis. So we're going to focus on what we uh, called the mechanisms of this information and I, I chose some examples to uh, explain what we mean by those things. So first of all is infantilization. It's a, a way to uh, simplif oversimplify something as if it was uh, being explained to a child. So you have no contrast, no context, no subtle uh, matters, all is very simplified. So I, I brought um, an example for you. It's this. See if you can uh, follow the video. Okay, so uh, it was it was about to start a little early. I don't know. I, I put it in the wrong. Uh, no, it's not that. Ah, this one. Andrea, we can hear the the video. I think you should. Uh, I, it. Yeah. Oh, okay. One second. Uh, 
let's see if it goes now. So they can find the key. Okay. How are you? Yes, okay. yes. Good. Twisting social media. That's made a habit of threatening our biggest social media companies with investigations and regulations should they fail to crack down on conservative perspectives. It is all held that Hillary Clinton lost in 2016. Blames companies like Facebook for so called fake news. Okay. Trump so. What I mean when I say um, what the mechanism of an infiltration is that but because she lost the election, she blames the companies for fake news. It's uh, just revenge. So um, another point is a commotion. So to to illustrate commotion, commotion is when you appeal to the most basic, most uh, um, angry reactions from people to uh, make them uh, overlook the subtilities of the argument. So to illustrate commotion, we're going to go back here and we're going to talk about the presidential campaign from 2018 in Brazil, where uh, it uh, was uh, very common on social media, the uh, penis bottle that supposedly uh, government was distrib distributing in um, daycare facilities in, as part of a gay kit in order to um, make children become homosexual since the very first age. So, of course, if you believe that the government is doing that, it, it is a, a horror and you have to stop it. So this is what I, I chose to illustrate um, commotion. Then there is another mechanism that is flooding. Flooding is when we uh, take a lot of other information about something in order to bury the, uh, uh, the, the main fact under a pile of um, not that important information. So to illustrate that, I chose uh, this one. Uh, the autopsy, a, uh, a piece of news that says that autopsy report says that George Floyd died from cardiopulmonary arrest, was po positive for COVID-19. It is probably really true, and this is one of the biggest problem with uh, these mechanisms of disinformation, is that they are rarely entirely false. So um, it's important to be really alert to those uh, techniques. Um, another one is, um, it's a, a couple, it's orientation and disorientation. Seems contrary, but it's not. Orientation is when you uh, direct uh, um, the audience to, to uh, conclude what you want them to conclude and disorientation is the contrary you say a lot of things to make people confused so uh, for uh, orientation I have in my family a um, uh, story that is is perfect for problem solution creation which is the goat story yeah there's a guy he lives with a lot of uh, family seven people in a small piece no money for food so he goes to uh, his uh, spiritual leader and asks, ah, that, how can I make my life better and the guy says uh, buy a goat the guy buys a goat brings the goat home next week he comes and he says no my life is a lot worse the goat uh it's it smells it eats everything it takes place it takes money to feed and then the guy says now you sell the goat and then the guy comes back the next week and say ah thank you so much my life is so much better now that i sold the goat and uh and that uh, that's that uh, it's um uh, problem solution creation. You create a problem to create a solution and then the person is happy. 
And another one of orientation is um, culpability. Uh, culpability, I brought something to illustrate that is uh, here in the, in the rape culture. We have, uh, this is very often the case uh, says the, 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 a girl is raped and says, oh no, maybe, did you see her dress? Oh no, maybe, mm, a girl walking that late all alone or she was flirting. So, uh, you know, uh, this is one of the um, techniques of orientation. Another one uh, in this orientation, we have the mix. You have denial, inversion, modification, and mix. The mix is, is the most um, uh, delicate because it mixes parts of truth and parts of uh, uh, hidden things. And I have a, I'm going to take my microphone off, and I have a video here of a cabinet meeting. And I'm not going to stand by and let them my family or my friends because I have changed someone in charge of security who was part of the structure. I'm going to change him. And if I can't change him, I'll change his boss. And if I can't change the boss, I'll change the minister. Full stop. Sitting at the meeting was none other than Sergio Moro. Okay. So this is part true, part why, and uh, all is mixed up. Uh, we're going to uh, continue with uh, disguised partiality. This is a technique where you you make um, you make people think that there is a, a, a real debate. And the example I, I, I chose to you is that mm, here. So you have a debate between uh, Gabriel Pioli, which is a, a teacher, and uh, Osmar Terra, which is an ex-minister. And uh, she says social isolation is effective against uh, the COVID-19. And he says it's not. So when you see uh, this picture, you can imagine that there is a 50-50 opinion. Half the people think it's good, half the people think it's not good, but it's not because there is not one, if there is, please tell me, uh, one, one uh, peer-reviewed paper in a scientific journal that says that uh, social isolation is not effective against uh, the COVID-19. So this is uh, uh, a good example of this guy's partiality. You look at it, you suppose there is a 50-50, uh, like a round earth or flat earth debate. It, it, it doesn't exist. Um, and finally, omission is the last um, technique. So it, it's uh, happened the last week. And um, we say, well, well it, we don't count. We don't count COVID cases. We don't count uh, COVID deaths anymore. We take out of the, the air the way we don't uh, give the um, information to the ministry so uh, we we don't say it doesn't exist uh, okay so uh these are the mechanisms that we put together and i and i because of uh uh, with the authors that we show here. And then finally, I'm going to talk about critical information literacy, which is um, a, a concept that uh, started in, um, in libraries 
and uh, critical information literacy is the ability to, to deal with information. And uh, critical information literacy is the, uh, the ability to deal with information in a critical way. So what, uh, what is a critical way? A critical way draws, the idea of critical draws from critical theory that says that science and, uh, uh, is not neutral and that uh, we should work to uh, diminish the inequality and critical pedagogy with our, our very own Brazilian Paulo Freire and um, also other uh, educators like Bell Hooks that says that education should be about uh, providing freedom to people and uh, freedom of the mind and freedom uh, to um, be them themselves in the world in order to address inequalities. So I use the uh, definition from Okardi Drabinsky and Cambia from 2010. And in my case, I include some feminist critical theories in my theoretical uh, discussion. In my uh, thesis that I'm writing now, I say it's a philosophy, a practice, and a constant goal of teaching and learning. Because it's not only ideas, it's not only practical, and it's not only um, uh, uh, something you can achieve. It's something you can you have to uh, pay attention all the time and develop all the time and be attentive all the time and uh, also that critical information literacy is an intersubjective skills and disposition to deal daily with information in an uh, autonomous and and conscient conscientious way i'm going to change that after so uh to finish my talk I remember to uh, remember at the beginning I, I put you the sprinkler spring code um, movie. Uh, in French, this expression is used to say when uh, someone is the, the victim of their own um, doing. And then I, I propose this reflection if um, as final thoughts. And did I just teach you a lot about information, disinformation, and critical information literacy? Or you were all victims or of my deliberate political tampered information that is a disinformation campaign. So um, think about it. I I ready to ask answer any questions you have uh, these are my uh, references for everything i said today and uh, thank you very much thank you andrea um it's so important going deeper in the concept we often hear only about fake news yeah. but we see now um how uh this information, misinformation encompasses way more things. Uh, and then, Matthew, you, you showed us uh, was a great illustration of how tricky this concept is. Um, okay, so we can we don't we don't have any comments or questions uh, so far. So we can uh, jump into Caio. Caio, you um, can you open your presentation, please? Uh, I, I have to stop sharing my. Okay. Are you guys seeing my screen? Yes. Oh, wait. This is way back at the Okay. Is everyone hearing me okay? Everything fine? Yes. Everyone hearing me? All right. Well, um, so I mentioned where I, I came from, where I'm going to, but I, I forgot to say where I am right now. So I'm a researcher 
at the center of, uh, for the analysis of liberty and authoritarianism. Uh, I'm not currently affiliated to the Oxford Internet Institute. I'm just using uh, some bits of presentations I have. Um, so I just thought it would be interesting to keep, uh, you know, Oxford's handle and stuff, since a lot that I'm using is from when I was there and you guys can look up. It's, a, it's an interesting place to look up resources. Uh, okay, so first of all, I'm very happy that Andrea covered the definition bit of disinformation, which is an extremely difficult uh, topic. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll take advantage of, it, of the things she said and, and build upon that. Um, also, I took the liberty to address informally. It's Saturday night here. I hope we, we can have an informal talk um, and maybe have a, more of a dialogue later on with questions and everything. So, okay. First of all, I'd like to point out um, that I'm going to talk a lot of, about Brazil. One, because most of the research I did in Brazil, and two, because Brazil is perhaps uh, the best bad example we can have in terms of disinformation regulation. First of all, because uh, you know we have a neo-populist government uh, in power that has this huge uh, information uh, communication apparatus that is being used uh, for disinformation campaigns, and second, because we're currently trying to stop that with disinformation laws. And as you might imagine from Andrea's presentation, defining fake news is really hard, even at a normal conversation. It's harder if we're trying to research it, and it's nearly impossible if we want to make it into a rule, into a law. Because in a law, you can't put little footnotes and say, well, for the purposes of this text, this information is this, and you know, you can, you, there's also another definition somewhere else. For a lot, the, everything needs to be very clear cut so you can actually enforce what you're trying to do, okay? So uh, what you're trying to prevent. So uh, just as a list of resources, the Computational Propaganda Project uh, puts everything they do online. It's available. You guys can reach out. There's a lot of interesting studies from uh, from countries all over the world and also global reports. I'm going to start by looking at specifically uh, a report from 2018 called the Global, global Cyber Troops Report. And it's really interesting because they look around um, news from several different countries to see if there are registers of disinformation, right? Like if, if New local news reported disinformation campaigns there, and and they start start to separate these events in typologies. Uh, so just by looking at the typologies that were uh, developed, you can have an idea of the different strategies that are used to try to confuse the public or you know mislead or in any way influence public opinion and capture the debate in order to favor a, a specific agenda. So I like this, this table is actually much bigger, it has different countries, like many other countries and different strategies. But one way to think about it, for example, is that you can have pro-government propaganda and pro-government fake news, uh, but you can also have attacks on the opposition. One that I particularly like is distracting or neutral messages where you capture the public debate. So people aren't talking about the issue that concerns you the most. Um, a good example here in Brazil is when the president released on his Twitter account, uh, one guy urinating at another, this is not a joke, this happened. And the whole debate in the legislative branch was about passing structural uh, social security reforms. So there are many things you, you can do to try to uh, nudge or actually capture the public debate. It's interesting to see this variety, and, and they probably went more into depth, depth than I, I intend to do. Um, what I also want to show in this, this report was that initially we were looking at 48 countries. 
in two, this, this is uh, a picture, this is a graph from the 2018 report, 48 countries, varying capacities of disinformation campaigns, only in very few countries you had what we call, um, sorry, what we have like a developed structure. So fully professional uh, communication companies dedicated to disinformation all of the time. So not only during the electoral period, um, this, this was restricted to a few countries like Russia, China, US, um, places like Brazil or Mexico had something more in, in between. And there was still that notion of, you know, the kids in the garage being hired to, to send out this information. Nowadays, things are much worse. Uh, the 2019 report has over 72 countries. Uh, the 2020 report should be coming out in the next few months. And it's interesting to see how this, this strategy, which we're broadly calling disinformation, has been adopted all over the world. Uh, and we kind of expect it to happen because it's political communication and the internet is all over. It's natural that political political uh, communication invades any sort of medium we find and we start using. Um, so to name a few examples that I saw when I, when I was research, researching this back in Oxford was disinformation on Tinder, um, disinformation on WhatsApp, WeChat and everything, and even people sending out pornography links with disinformation uh, in large WhatsApp groups. So the whole idea was that the, that little description you get on WhatsApp, it would be accusing a candidate of pedophilia, for example. And in certain places where you have uh, zero rated data, so uh, for WhatsApp, data is free. If you want to leave WhatsApp, you start paying. A lot of people don't want to leave that environment to fact check. So it could be, I saw this strategy, I don't know how, how effective it is, but it's one of the strategies going around. Um, so I'm saying this to remind you that, remind you guys, or point out to you guys that disinformation is not inherent to one platform or the other. It's inherent to the internet, and we need to think ways to uh, to handle this uh, this very complex um, this very complex phenomenon. Um, and this is the issue going on in Brazil right now. People have not taken the, so this is personal, personal opinion. Uh, legislative has not stopped to think about what's the definition of fake news. So we don't, if we don't have an appropriate definition, how can we make it prohibited? Um, sorry, I'm, I'm just controlling time. Um, okay, so talked a little bit about this information around the globe, gave you guys a list of resources to look at. Um, so now I'm going to talk about three methodologies that we, I have used to look at disinformation. I'm assuming this to be useful for you guys. And um, I don't know if any of you are in academia and might be thinking of ways to study this online. So uh, first one, we were looking at Twitter. Uh, this is a methodology that that Oxford use, well, the Oxford Internet in Institute uses a lot to analyze electoral periods. So we collected tweets from, uh, sorry, we collected tweets from the main candidates uh, running for presidency. I have hashtags for each of the candidates, and we monitored them, and we kept an eye out for accounts that were tweeting these political hashtags over 50 times a day, which we thought was suspicious. So we called them high frequency tweeting, uh, uh, tweeting accounts. Um, it, it's a red flag for a bot, but we can't say it's a bot because you know maybe someone decides to tweet over 50 times a day, one specific hashtag, it, it's possible. Uh, we did this research with the help of Graphica, which is a think tank in the US. Um, that also looks at disinformation. And it was very shocking to us right before the, the, uh, the, the first round of our electoral campaign, how the tweets were divided. 
So first of all, this could be resulting from our methodology. So it's not, let's say, uh, empirical proof of polarization, but it's a very interesting result. How the tweets, you had like two masses of tweets that were completely separated from the other. And you can see a, a very clear cut here. So one group was not talking to the other group, which in a way sounds expected, but if we compare it to 2016 in the US, you can see there's a few agendas that eventually connect the two different extremes. So this is the first sign that society is extremely polarized and this is showing up in social media. For me, this was the most interesting finding from Twitter. Uh, the second most interesting finding was that we only found 1.2, um, what we call junk news, or poor, uh, information of poor quality. So we were only looking at news links that were, were being shared. We extracted the, those links and we, and we analyzed them according to what we had. And we found a very low number. And interestingly enough, uh, this seemed to be a trend in, in Latin America. Mexico had a, um, an election that was very close to Brazil uh, just a few months before, and also a very low number. And uh, it was interesting. And, and it says a lot, a lot about what, what the use of Twitter in many of these countries. Twitter is an open platform. So people use to seek out news, and most likely you're going to find what a politician is saying what a news media is saying, but you're not going to find the really dark stuff going around, especially because you know Brazil had passed a law specifically directed to disinformation during the campaign. So that was that made sense. When we move to WhatsApp, though, things start to change. Uh, I participated in two different researches uh, on what we accessed over 200 groups. Um, this one specifically, we used 110 groups, uh, sorry, this one 130 groups, and we ran a network analysis. So looking at 200 groups and, and how they're interacting with each other, and we found out that there was a, a very intense sharing of members across the groups. So what that means is that even though in theory you had isolated WhatsApp groups, in truth, you had 200 groups that had the same content going about, and you had some strategic uh, users that were responsible for sending out this content. And we could find accounts that were sending out messages 3,400 uh, times in a day. So also, again, uh, strong signs of, of automation. And in many cases, we saw centralized um, Moderator, moderation, so the same group where people would control 17, 20 different groups. This is a strategy that was able to transform WhatsApp, uh, a peer-to-peer -peer messenger system with, with, some, with the capacity of making groups, into a large-scale broadcast communication network. Very intelligent strategy, brilliant strategy, and up to 2018, very different. Uh, so this is the structure we identify. In another paper, we, we decided to look at uh, um, what, what, what was the content going on using a similar methodology to what we had on Twitter. Uh, for this purpose, we at 110 groups. Few striking things. One third of the messages were audiovisual, so videos, audio messages, or memes. One sixth were links. So from the start, we have to ask the question: um, Are we really talking about a conversation, or is it just broadcasting content? If one out of every messages is not, you know, someone saying something, but sending a, a viral video or a link. Is that conversation? That's one of the, the methodological problems we found. So we extracted 50,000 links, and 40% of them pointed to YouTube. That says a lot. Going back to what I, what I said in the beginning about there being a lot of platforms being used, 
this is one of the, four, the, the very strong uh, evidences we have that actually platforms aren't instrumentalized alone. You have an ecosystem of platforms that are being used together to send out this information. Um, the professional content dropped. If on Twitter we had 50% of professional content, so either from political parties or from news media, now um, the, the professional content dropped to 27%. Um, and disinformation, only looking at the URLs, went from 1.2 on Twitter to 13.1 on, on um, WhatsApp. So it, it's very clear to us that disinformation migrated from the open spaces where they can be san sanctioned and law enforcement has more power to encrypted peer-to-peer -peer networks. This, this was a very in interesting finding and very insightful for our elections. I dare say that WhatsApp isn't the major problem today. So uh, a few weeks ago, actually, maybe a month ago, I released a new report looking specifically at YouTube. Um, and I just picked out a few screenshots. I'm going to start with this one, actually. Um, what we did was that we looked at virtually all Brazilian videos related to coronavirus. It's as, as if you went to the search bar, typed coronavirus, hit enter, and then one by one you access the videos, one by one access the, their recommendations, and then the following recommendations. And we collected text data, so comments, descriptions, uh, subtitles, uh, types, and, and everything. So we had a whole corpus of words that were used in these videos, these videos. And then with lexical analysis, we could separate into groups. So we'd find one group where religious communication is stronger, another group where you know financial market was the, was the main thing, uh, conspiracy theories. And we selected four groups to analyze it. And then we, we did a qualitative analysis. We looked at the videos that had more views, the channels that had more that had more subscribers, and we you know, decided to check out what was going on. That's when this video comes in, which is just an example of the stuff we found. So what this video says is a report comes in from Italy, coronavirus and the psychological warfare against the Christian, um, the, the Christian West. So it's, it's a very sensationalist video. It also evolves evokes this idea of enemy and ally. So there's an enemy from the East that is developing psychological warfare and biological guns to destroy our way of life in the West. This is very interesting from these, the, the disinformation campaigns we identified because even though they had their own themes, uh, especially the political ones, they converged to similar topics. So people, religious uh, disinformation. So this is important. I'm not saying that all, disinform all religious speech is disinformation. Absolutely not what I'm saying. Religious speech is very important in our society. But there were people that used religious speech to justify disinformation, OK? And somehow they start with you know, interpretations of the Bible. And that would trickle down to the East is trying to destroy our Christian way of life. And somehow they would bring up issues of uh, values of nation, family, uh, Christian lifestyle, Christian values, and uh, economic model. So there's an attack against the capitalist economic model. Interestingly enough, in the conspiracy theories uh, network, uh, people would talk about biological warfare, you know, the virus was made up in a lab to destroy us. Um, there would be some kind of spooky, random evidence, like someone pointing to a Sonic uh, movie uh, on, out on the theater and saying, well, that's a clear reference to the pangolin where coronavirus came from. 
So that's proof that people knew what was going on and someone was trying to tell us. And this is all a big strategy to do the West, the, our nation, our families, and our capitalist model. Extremely interesting. And it's, it's extremely interesting how all of these campaigns somehow targeted the news source, the information sources in society. So what's the idea here? Um, there's no absolute truth. I'm glad Andre again pointed that out. Um, it's perspective. So it, it, it's in a way, it's a social construct. There is, disinformation isn't this virus of ignorance that goes around making people, turning people into idiots. It's something more complicated than that. So I think of the spaces where we're debating as the public sphere, uh, we clash opinions, we discuss, and somehow when we reach consensus, we're able to pressure political leaders to shift the public policy, to pass a law, and so on. So what's the role of information in all this? Information is what irrigates our debate, what gives, what gives us capacity to compare views, to validate our views, um, to inform. Well, information informing is a bit tautological. I apologize for that. And how do we obtain information in, in society? We develop institutions across time that are responsible for that. They're not judges of the truth. They're, they don't own the truth. But they have methodologies and, um, and codes of conduct that allow us, allow us to, to one, make accurate readings of the truth. So what is the best methodology to come to the conclusion that the earth is not flat? So you can measure uh, the shadow while the sun goes around. You can get a rocket and go around the planet. You know, there's several methodologies. Some of them work, some of them don't work. So if you just look into the horizon and you see something flat, uh, you'll, you'll be led to think that the Earth is actually flat. Uh, another example is recurrent attacks to the media. So the media has a specific, a specific procedure to release information. And in case they release something wrong, there's a procedure for correcting, right? Something that we don't see in this information. Um, so th these institutions that I call the, we call the, the expert systems, uh, they don't own the truth, but they de develop mechanisms which allows, uh, allows us to make readings, validate these readings, and disseminate them in society. And these institutions are the ones being targeted now. Why? One, political purposes. For example, what I mentioned, nation, family, capitalism. This discourse usually aligns with a specific candidate or party. The second reason is uh, economic interest. So there were separate groups where you had doctors who said, you know, um, if you want to stay safe from the coronavirus, you just kind of you just have to live a healthy life. If you buy my ebook and you know look, look uh, follow my course, uh, you'll have a healthy li lifestyle. You'll be safe from coronavirus. You'll be safe from cancer. We actually saw that people saying they can cure cancer. So these are the two main motivations, and they benefit from dismantling these structures of, that, that create information in our society. So universities, um, specialized agencies, international organizations such as the World Health Organization, media, and so on. So what one of the big trends we see today is disinformation with the specific purpose of dismantling the, the system that brings us information. Um, so for me, and now I'm, I'm drawing to a conclusion, for me, the big question now is, or one of the big questions, I, I feel there are many questions, um, how should we act when disinformation isn't a lie anymore that is going around? It's not like a virus that is infecting people and turning them into idiots, as you know, a lot of people believe. Um, but we actually have an epistemic crisis. We have an absurd amount of information being produced on the internet. We have news sources, which are credible, credible sources, which have an important role. 
for example, there are YouTubers that read scientific stuff, make them palatable for the general public and release that. So there is a demand for new ways to organize information and access. Uh, we had, we've, we have had in the past several issues with the existing system of experts, including in the media. We know the media is biased and sometimes it, it pretends not to be biased. Um, so it, it's a big crisis on where is our information coming from, how do we validate it, and how do we create mechanisms to, do, to create trust and not about mechanisms to uh, prohibit and in some, way, in some way inhibit lies from going around. It doesn't make sense to prevent uh, a priest from saying, for example, that Eve came from, from Adam's rib. We all know that's false, but that has its place in religious re, uh, discourse. How do we create mechanisms where religious discourse isn't somehow distorted or used to distort science and then um, harm the whole of society. In conclusion, for me, that's the big question. How do we create trust and mechanisms of finding and validating and disseminating the truth? With that, I conclude my, my presentation. I'd be glad to take any questions. Uh, again, these are my contacts. Uh, I've included Oxford contacts since I, I used so much of their, their research here. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caio. Um, I think your, your presentation and Andrea's presentation were super connected. Uh, after going in more in deep in, in the, the concept, you show us evidence of um, instrumentalization of disinformation strategies. Uh, particularly in the context of elections, uh, we see how important it is to discuss this topic carefully. Uh, legislative agenda must be aware of the, the issue, but way more debate is needed before we pass a bill claiming that it will prevent fake news or disinformation to spread. So thank you very much. Um, do we have uh, questions or comments from the audience? You can use the, the chat box now. Or you can use a microphone. Uh, no hi. one. Hi, I have a question. Uh, okay, Lucas. So, th thank you, Andrea and Caio, for your presentation. Uh, um, my question is more related also to the, the material that we received. And um, you guys focused on disinformation, and in the material, it makes this distinguishment between um, disinformation and misinformation. Is thinking that uh, misinformation would be less, uh, let's say, precarious to society because the people sharing it actually believe it that is true. The the false information they believe the false information is true, so there is no intent to do harm. Um, but con considering that today we see a complete aversion to, to science and to the scientific method, for example, even Kaya said about the flat earthers, and we can talk about also the anti-vaccine people. Um, wouldn't this in itself also be considered uh, politically dangerous? And if this distinction even matter between misinformation and disinformation, and even if the person thinks that a false information is true, I think it's more uh, troublesome that they are not open to actually, you know, discuss or even trade sources or trade methods to see that maybe invalidate or validate their their assumptions. So uh, that's my question. Guilherme, are we going to collect a few questions or are we going to go one by one? Uh, do okay, we have a specific uh, order? Yeah, we have Benjamin now. Benjamin, do you want to drop your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Well, uh, civil society is making an effort to verify the information. 
For example, uh, in Mexico, there is a project called uh, Verificado, Verifier, which is precisely uh, in charge of verifying information to fight fake news and misinformation. Uh, I don't know if in other countries, uh, similar initiatives are carried out by civil society or by the government. My question is, do you consider it important that the organization in charge of fighting fake news and verifying information is from the private sector? taking into account that the government may also be involved in aspects of misinformation, or should we think of a kind of local organization with a multi-sector system to combat these problems? Thank you. Um, we don't have any more questions or comments so far, so you, okay, Giovanna, Giovanna, you may take the floor. Thank you, Guilherme. Hi, um, good evening, everyone. I'd like um, to ask you something about um, the proposition of um, regulating fake news in, in Brazil. So like Caio was um, showing how the disinformation um, process kind of happens inside the platforms. And in this um, approach, the Brazilian approach for those here who are not from Brazil, there is this idea of trying to go for whoever sent the, the first message that is going to be forwarded between um, the other people. So I'd like to know um, whether you agree, if you think that this is um, an approach that we should really rely on, like to um, find whoever was um, responsible for sending the first message that caused this information. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanna. Um, no more questions so far, so Andrea, Caio. Ah, uh, okay. So uh, to the first question, Lucas, uh, uh, in Portuguese, we don't have this distinction between misinformation or disinformation. We call everything disinformation. And um, it's interesting because how do you measure intent if the person is inadverted or if the person means to to spread it it's very difficult what we can what we can do and this is my solution at the educational end of it is to make people more conscious of their role in in this in, uh, disseminating this information but uh, you know there is a lot of um, there is a lot of uh, definitions and um, there is also malinformation I think uh, which is uh, something created to do harm you know in Portuguese, we don't have that, so I, I write this information every, in, in, every, in everything I write. Um, uh, how do we do that? I go to, we go to Caio to answer Lucas, or I, ans I answer the other one? Um, you, can, you can go and answer those, the, the other questions. Okay. So to Benjamin, uh, we have here some, some agencies to check the facts. And um, uh, it's Alfatos, there are several of them, um, Agência Lupa. And uh, about the private sector and the government uh, issues, I'm not sure I understand your, your question. Can you? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I, I don't know that uh, if these agencies uh, good, good lead uh, to government or for the civil society, because many times uh, the government can be uh, uh, or, or may also be involved in aspect of misinformation. I don't know if I explain. Uh, from, from what I know from these agencies, I have some friends in Lupa. Uh, what they do 
is that they check uh, the basis of the piece of information and they uh, they gouge they decide if this is more um, uh, close to the truth far from the truth we cannot say yet it's not um, it's rarely a stamp as I, as i said in my speech it's it's very difficult to establish with a certitude what is true and what is what is false is more easily uh statable we can say it's a lie and to say it's true mm, it's more difficult but uh what what these agencies do is that they check the origins for example if the government says that uh, uh 500 people died from covid and uh, there is a uh, report from a lot of uh health secretaries that says otherwise they they check they call they they email and they put put us put us yes, no it's closed we don't know yet maybe uh and yes, I, I think, I believe, I'm, I don't work for them, but I believe they are independent as independent as one can be. And uh, to Giovanna, excellent question also. Um, there is uh, in, the, in my program, we heard, we received a lot of emails about the regulations and people say, yes, we need a regulation. Finally, we're going to regulate fake news. And then there is the, the other part of my field that says, oh no, stop, wait a minute. Uh, the society didn't have the opportunity to debate this. Uh, this is a law, this is going to uh, punish people. This is going to take content out. This is going to establish responsibility and it's a very very delicate question because the, the difference between uh what is um what is uh, uh um, protection of the truth and uh, censorship is it's it's so thin we can we cannot start by saying as uh, kayo said it's very very difficult to uh, define disinformation, define what if we go to state what is the truth there is centuries of philosophers that debate what is the truth so um what my field proposes and those of my field that participate in um gatherings like like yours because you lack like IGF is, is, is a kind of a, um, a group that is going to fight for those uh, issues is that they ask that uh, there is a debate there is a large debate between uh, different sectors of society before anything is rushed into decision so this is what uh, my field can contribute and what I could um, read about the... There are several, two or three in the Senate, in the Parliament, in the, um, you know. Thank you, Andaya. Caio? Okay, so a few interesting questions. Uh, and I realize, I, I should apologize for delivering this in English since we're Latin America. Maybe we should go for Spanish, but I, my Spanish is, in, is, is pretty bad. It's Portuñol. So uh, I think we owe that to ourselves, but I, I, I realize that's not our case uh, right now. Um, and okay, so I think there's a very important point that was raised by Lucas and Benjamin uh, that can be treated as one. Giovanna also raised an important point. I'll, I'll mention it in, after that, after the first point. So first of all, the issue between separating uh, misinformation and disinformation, we really focus our rules on punishing 
when that's maybe not the best way to go around solving issues, right? Uh, we see, for example, criminality. I, I know this is the reality in Brazil. I think it's the reality in many other American countries, so including uh, the USA, where you have this huge penitentiary system and you like to lock up people, but it doesn't solve the background problems of inequality that cause crime rates, right? So of all the rules, we're, of all the laws we're trying to pass in Congress, the, the bills, I think only two of them are about media literacy. So we're less worried about educating people and sitting with them and saying, well, you know, this is how you use the internet. The internet is not just WhatsApp or Facebook or whatever. The internet, you know, you can go to YouTube, look up videos that will actually, actually educate you and teach you how to change a car tire how to fix your phone, eventually even how to have an informal profession. So by focusing on the punitive way, we're really, really oversimplifying the issue of disinformation. So my aunt, I have, I, this is a real person, I have an aunt that reproduces everything that goes around uh, the delirious lies and everything. And, and she really embraced the identity of that extreme right. And um, well, do I think she should be punished for what she's saying? Is she doing it on purpose? Uh, is it, you know, is it, does she have bad intentions or is she just someone who has been fooled? Either way, I don't think she's the head of a large scheme. I think she's, you know, uh, just part of a big mass of people that are somehow being manipulated. In this regard, I don't think it's about punishing her, perhaps educating her of, you know, making a, a appropriate choices on the internet of what to share and not to share. So the issue of is it disinformation or misinformation is somewhat tangential to how do we understand uh, this phenomenon and we're gonna handle it in all of its different uh, facades, right? Um, and how does that tie in to what Benjamin was saying? And Verificado in, in, um, in Mexico is a pretty, from, from what I hear, is a great initiative. Uh, at least I know that the fact checkers in Brazil really appreciate Verificado. I, I went to, I worked with the Instituto Nacional Electoral of Mexico. Verificado was there, they were pretty impressive. Um, so it's great that we have fact checkers and I don't have a particular problem with them you know, being private organizations, assuming that you have mechanisms to control um, their, their independency. The issue is fact checkers are not truth checkers, okay? They can go after something, investigate and validate, well, you know, this image is a hoax or this image has been somehow uh, distorted, decontextualized, but they're not gonna validate political narratives. What we make out of the facts and the view that we, uh, that we um, obtain from reality is pretty much us and, and comes from this whole discourse we have. So I, I think this is another mistake that um, countries around the world try to do is to pass fact checkers as truth checkers. First of all, they don't have the scale, even if they wanted to, and they don't, they do not want that role. They don't want to be truth checkers because then you have just an incentive for a bunch of new uh, fact checkers to come out and validate these, these narratives. Um, so they're not truth checkers and they won't solve this political issue. We can't throw to technology and to like half a dozen people an issue that really comes from how we're organizing our, ourselves and we promote debate in society. Um, so fact checkers are good, they help, they help my grandma or my grandpa to see the difference between a hoax and a, a, a real information or even for us sometimes we see some absurd stuff uh, and it happens to be true and it's nice to have that validated but they're not going to solve this issue uh, this broader political issue that goes around you know creating polarization in society creating the us them narratives it's something much broader that we have um, and and we, we can think of examples. Uh, the, the, the example I use of the president that put a video of one person urinating and the other is that that was true. That was 100% true. That happened. 
and the people who did it came to public and asked the president to take it down. But he was using that in a context to uh, point out certain people in society as enemies, particularly people who, uh, in this case, it was particularly LGBTQ people because they were part of a parade and they were, he was saying something like, hey, look at these guys who enjoy carnival. They're all about destroying your moral. So you can twist stuff with, with truth. You can st twist reality with true stuff as well. Uh, I think the issue is broader than pointing out false falsehoods in society. And that dialogues as well with what jo Giovanna was saying. And by the way, hi, Giovanna. Uh, I've met Giovanna before. I worked at IES, where Giovanna is right now. So uh, sending out a hi. Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, one of the solutions that people are trying to pass here in Brazil about uh, thinking specifically of WhatsApp, and it's probably something that is going to happen uh, around the world as well. Uh, WhatsApp is encrypted, and somehow down the line, you receive an image and you think, wow, this is fake news. This is, you know, the penis bottle or something like that. Someone is guilty. You need to run back and see who's the first person to shoot out this message. And what the solution that was thought out was basically somehow recording every time the message hops around and then somehow you can find who started it. I'm against that solution. At first it makes sense, but if we think about it, we're associating the message to, the, to believing a falsehood, which isn't necessarily true, right? Um, a person could send that same image to a journalist or to a police officer and say, hey, you should look into this. And somehow we're assuming that everyone that participated in that chain is, commi is committing an illegal act and they're not entitled to their privacy concerning that message. That's the first problem. We're violating uh, confidentiality, even if partially in mass, and we're making assumptions based on that. It's like saying that everyone that liked a post agrees with it. That's not true. That's an incorrect assumption. The, sec the second incorrect assumption is that uh, it assumes that the first message of a chain is the person who started it. When you know you could pop copy paste it from somewhere else, you could print screen from Instagram and then send it over on WhatsApp or just share it from YouTube from any other platform. So this solution ignores the complexity of this ecosystem of platforms. And that's why, again, I think it's trying to regulate a phenomenon that it doesn't understand. Uh, and thank you for the question. I think, I think they're all in a way related. Thank you, Caio. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, we have time for uh, one last question, quick question from Eduarda. Hi, everyone. Are you hearing me? Yes. Okay. So I want to thank you, thanks Caio and Andrea for their great presentation. It was uh, very informative. And I would like to know just a little bit more of what do you think uh, about what is the role of the platforms in the dissemination of fake news? What it would be appropriate to hold them accountable or not? I think that is the discussion that we are having now in Brazil about Facebook and if they are responsible for the contents of uh, other people. So what do you think uh, about that, um, that new type of responsabilization? Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the questions. It's a very good question. Um, what uh, what can I say? I um, there is a, a paper from Molly Crockett, and she goes about uh, how we are always uh, enraged in the in the Facebook and uh, how the algorithm is. Um, trying to get you to be enraged all the time because then you engage more and this means more clicks more money more presence time and, and 
Tetra, and she studies the uh, horrible effect there that uh, that causes in our health. Um, so from from there, uh, I think yes, platforms are accountable to the addiction and the uh, the stimulation of uh, more and more and more and more and more and more all the time. To me, my personal view, not uh, specifically as an information science, I think, uh, uh, scientist, I think it's uh, like the pandemic. Uh, it's not something that came to tell us something. It's something that came and that, that tells us something. And then uh, in my personal view, I think that it means we have to slow down. And uh, I, I, I'm part of a network for information literacy in, in Rio, and we're starting to put together a forum that is going to happen in a few days or weeks. I don't know. It goes so fast. Uh, about infodemic. So this is um, something that we should think about. Um, maybe uh, it, it really means that we have to slow down. We, we can't continue like that. And, and platforms that make money uh, on us being there, uh, yes, they are accountable. But uh, I'm, I, I agree with Caio. It's not uh, by regulating, um, it's not. I, I, I am at the educational point because information literacy is that, media literacy and digital literacy and data literacy. It's all about understanding. And my, my point always is that we have to understand information. We have to, underst we have to let go of the ideal of truth, the ideal of neutrality. We have to let go of that. We have to, to be more aware and more responsible. And we have to be more alert about information. And, uh, and, and really um, do the step to um, have a, a more responsible relationship with information. So... Um, I'll, I'll build on what Andrea is saying, which I fully agree. I think um, what can we attribute to the platform? So let, let's think of two roles. One is the platform as near uh, pipes where information goes through. If that's the case, there, there are communication infrastructure, infrastructure, so they're not responsible for what's going on. Whoever is responsible is somewhere else using that information is, is on the edges the other situation is editorial content so like a newspaper which is they part actively participate on the content so if they're participating uh they are you know they're saying what you're reading so they are responsible for that the big idea is people who say stuff are responsible for what they said um we're somewhere in between with platforms because even if they're not influencing exactly what we're saying, there are algorithms which we don't fully understand how they work. Uh, we don't have access to that. And I think there's a big parallel debate there on transparency and accessing and regulating the algorithms themselves, which relates to disinformation, but it's something broader. Um, we need to be able to say two things. What, who is responsible for um, moderating content online, that's one. And two, um, wait, I forgot two, just a second. Who's responsible for moderating? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I diverged. Um, and two, uh, who is able to establish what is correct and not correct online? And these are different, okay? I'm, I'm gonna give you an example. We have no problem uh, allowing platforms to filter child pornography automatically. They do it all the time. If you try to upload something, they'll run it against this database. If they find it, you're not gonna, even going to be able to upload it. So initially, we have a standard of freedom of expression, and we allow 
the platforms to be the moderators of that, the judges of that, and to say if that is truth or not. Okay. Now, this is an entirely different issue when we're talking about political expression. It's much more complicated uh, to moderate political expression because you can have false positives and false negatives. You can have a situation where you're preventing someone from saying, from you know, saying their opinion when actually it's just an opinion. There's no falsehood there, or there's no damage being done, or, or vice versa. Is you let something that is damaging go around. So, should we let the platforms do that? Yes or no? If they can do that, who is going to be the arbiter of truth? Is it going to be the platforms themselves that are going to say, well, I was right, or I'm going to correct that? Or are we going to leave that for the judiciary power, which is usually uh, the most legitimate power to appreciate these borderline situations? This comes down to what, how do we understand freedom of speech online? Before trying to punish what is false, because as I said, falsehood has, falsehoods have their place in society. Uh, Santa Claus, Easter Rabbit, uh, Adam's, you know, Adam and Eve, they have their places in society. So we have to decide what does this new freedom of speech online looks like? What are the responsibilities? And then we can decide, well, you know, uh, political speech can be given to platforms to moderate maybe fact check stuff i don't know but th this debate has to come before the debate of whether they're they're going to be the arbiters of everything online hope that makes sense that made sense thank you kayo um so uh we don't have any more we don't have more questions or comments and we are just in time to close this webinar but before we finish, um, I want to thank Caillou and Andrea for accepting our invitation. Uh, many great insights and, and questions. Also, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, just to let you know, we have an open call for uh, sessions proposal uh, for Youth Like a Jeff 2020. And also you can apply uh, for attending the event. Uh, the call will be open until June uh, 30th. More information please check our social media. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Kyle and Ray again. If you have any uh, final thoughts, also. I'll just say thanks uh, for inviting us. And thanks, Andrea, also for your presentation. I learned a lot. Uh, hope we can meet again <laughs> in future presentations. And that's it. Thank you all very much for, for staying up so late also. Yes, uh, indeed, it was very, very good. Thank you to Caio and thank you all uh, youth like IGF. I hope this is um, issues that you're going to work and debate and uh, propose solutions because uh, youth and, uh, you know, uh, good luck. And uh, I'm open, my email is on the presentation. You can contact me or tweet, Twitter, I, I use Twitter too. So let's stay in touch. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.